Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Quora video. This is going to be some speculation about what I think is going to happen in uh, Legend of Korra Runes of the Empire Part 3. Uh, the book's coming out February 25th, 2020. So there's only about three months until this book comes out. That's a, that's a much smaller wait than we've had in the past while for a comic. So why not get the speculation out of the way uh, you know, sooner rather than later. So let's begin here with the description, the, the sort of marketing description we've had for a while, but what does it tell us about part three? Kubira's true, uh, sorry, Kubira's true nature is revealed and the Earth Kingdom will feel the consequences. Thanks to Commander Guan and Dr. Shang's brainwashing technology, all hope for a fair election in the Earth Kingdom is lost. Korra works with Toph, Sue, and Kuvira to plan a means to rescue not just the brainwashed Mako, Bolin, and Asami, but everyone else caught up in Guan's plan. With the Earth Empire potentially on the rise again, Kuvira pulls another trick from her sleeve, but whose side is she truly on? I find this description to be very, like, out of place having read part one and part two it almost doesn't fit in some ways and i think that the main thing that doesn't fit is the way that they're talking about kuvira and um, anyone who's read part one and part two i think you would be a bit surprised to see her being talked about in the part three description of like her true nature revealed you know pulling another trick from her sleeve whose side is she on these aren't the questions the book has been asking so far. This is not at all what we've been exploring with Kuvira across Runes of the Empire Part 1 and Part 2. Now, they could absolutely pull a kind of big twist in Part 3 and have Kuvira go back in that direction, be the villain again, and it would be probably pretty big, pretty impactful if they did. But it's not where the development has been heading in Part 1 and Part 2. Like, just look at the, the few pages of backstory we've got across Part 1 and Part 2. Look at the way Kuvira has been acting around Korra, Team Avatar, Sue. It would, it would just be sort of like almost a waste of time for Part One and Part Two if they went down that direction. This definitely, to me, feels more like a marketing tagline thing of just they had to put something on the Part Three cover, but they couldn't spoil stuff like Batar coming back, the details of what happened in Part Two. So they have to be as generic as possible. And I think that's why like, we have stuff like the cover having Mako, uh, Bolin, and Asami together brainwashed. Even though Asami is actually now with you know Korra and crew on the, the ship. She's still brainwashed, but she's not next to Mako and Bolin. So the only way that that can actually happen is if Asami somehow escapes. Or they do some sort of a thing where they like unbrainwash Asami and then send her back in as like a... You know, uh, you know, double agent or something like that, which would be cool. I don't know if there's the time necessarily to set that up and what exactly Asami would particularly be going in to accomplish, but it, it all depends on how they actually go about reversing the brainwashing and what, what method it is, because if they do it to Asami and Asami can be given whatever method to unbrainwash people, she could absolutely be the one to free Mako and Bolin. That would be a very cool uh, kind of responsibility to give to Asami in part three to give her some development. But like I said, the description, the main thing is definitely in terms of an interesting stuff is what they say about Kavira, but it also doesn't really fit what's going on. The rest of it is like, okay, Earth Kingdom will, or Earth Kingdom will feel the feel. Earth Kingdom will feel the consequences, you know, yeah, of course we're dealing with big stuff for the Earth Kingdom here. The brainwashing technology, of course. The election is likely lost at this point, at least in Gaoling. We'll see how the book goes about, like, covering that in terms of, like, are they just going to accept now that, like, Guan gets voted uh, governor of Gaoling, but then the election moves on to other places? Because the, the cover suggests that most of the action is going to be uh, taking place in, in Zhao Fu, which is where, of course, uh, our heroes have sort of retreated to for now. So we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly how it all plays out, but, um, you know, for the most part, the, the description really doesn't tell us all that much. So we are reliant on what we do know from part one and part two, more so than trying to fit stuff into the description that we have. So we'll keep Kubira a little bit for later, and let's cover some of the other stuff. So... I'll actually start with uh, Wu, since he was the sort of cliffhanger ending to part two of that he's going to be brainwashed. So, 
they obviously set up some stuff with Wu that makes it clear that it isn't just going to be saving him for the brainwashing. They're going to have to make him have him make a big decision because the tease thread all part two and in a way some of part one was actually now you're questioning was it the right decision to immediately try and have these elections in the earth kingdom is it too much change too quick after the earth kingdom is just sort of getting back on its feet after the chaos of book three and book four um the people likely do just want stability. There's perhaps not as much of a need for all this change and trying cre- to create progress. That can come, but for now, the Earth Kingdom, like it's sort of known for, one of the traits you always associate with the Earth Kingdom is sort of survival and like st- stability. Um, so I think that's what you want. And, you know, Wu is technically still the king, He's shown himself to be at least an, a solid enough leader. He's developed into someone that like, you can respect. And the question that the, the vision from Hu Ting was, was like, is he taking this sort of coward's way out? Is he just trying to have his life where he, whatever he said he was, he's going off to become a singer or a dancer or whatever. Is he, you know, has he even tried? Has he considered the possibility that he could make a good leader that he might actually be the one to you know be the the best king that the earth kingdom has had in in a long time and that's the question like you already had him thinking that like oh to stop guan we'll have to maybe cancel the election so um would it be that big of a thing at the end of this book we cure Wu of the brainwashing and he makes the decision that actually yeah, I I think part of why I uh, decided about these elections was maybe too quick. It was so I didn't have to to play the big role. I think we need to. We'll think about it. We'll still consider the elections, but we'll put it on hold for now. Uh, I'll be the leader. We'll stabilize for the next you know few months or whatever year, and then we'll think about elections. We'll see what the people are. How they're responding to some stability. How they're reacting to the idea of a potential switch and how, how things are run. That, to me, is probably the, the the more obvious, maybe, choice to go about things. Because otherwise, like, the, the comics have to cover a lot of information of, like, who's the governor here, who's the governor here. And while they likely just will, will treat that as sort of background information that they'll tell us when we need it... Um, it is still a huge thing to happen that will just require so much stuff to happen. Like, um, I, I'd be shocked if it did sort of go ahead and for like the next however many comics we're still talking about elections are going on and, and so on and changing it. So I think for now, we're, it probably will likely end maybe with like, maybe those elections won't go ahead right now. Maybe we will decide that he does want to you know try try out as king and and see how it goes and um, at least in terms of character arc stuff that's where they may be heading but that's the thing with runes of the empire you can take the setup that they have so far either way hu ting was she just saying that to was she saying that to honestly try and change Wu so he would accept the leadership and uh, realize that there's positives and negatives to decisions that he's making or was it just to sort of the swamp trying to upset him and that he has has actually made the made the right decision and it will help that the decision that he's made and this was just meant to be Hu Ting who wasn't a particularly great leader um you know criticizing Wu who's making some actually good decisions like what what way are you actually meant to view it uh, is the the question so I, I'm not particularly sure but in terms of Wu being brainwashed, the obvious direction there is that Guan now has the support of the king, and he will likely cement his uh, leadership in um, at least as the the governor of Gaoling. And we'll see how they go about stuff like: is there a rule in place that like Guan can't run as like the like governor of another place or another place? Especially with like Wu there to to potentially just say go ahead with everything, 
that 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 could be the way that they go. So Guan just ends up winning all the elections. Like I suppose we're sort of questioning like might there be a little bit of a time skip in the middle of this comic and we sort of could ahead to you know parts of the earth kingdom have actually been sort of taken over by guan a lot of the election the elections have taken place i don't really know like th- th- there's there is a lot of ways they could um could go about that um but we'll we'll we'll, we'll likely just have to wait and see um they did have that moment in part two where the guy who Toph went to to become an official candidate did say that, like, in the event of, like, a force majeure, uh, the elections can be stopped. So I assume that sort of subsection will likely come up here. Someone will mention it that, wait, there's some pretty crazy stuff going on by the rules of the elections. We can't actually go ahead while it's so crazy. I, I think something like that what might happen to just stop Guan's plan in a slightly different way um speaking of Guan well we move on to the next thing with him and that is just the brainwashing so I covered Wu but what about the fact that we still have Mako Bolin, Asami and a bunch of other people brainwashed um how are they going to do that and was this the best plot point to sort of have in the first place uh, I've said it a few times before now at this point that I think it probably would have been a better idea to do the reverse of what they did and actually have Korra get brainwashed and it be Kuvira having to team up with Korra's team the three people who sort of of the four kind of trust her the least because you know Korra is the one ultimately of the main characters who sort of is willing to give Kuvira the chance the most uh, Asami is meant to be of like Korra's uh, the main people around Korra the one who really is against Kuvira Mako because he's a police officer and stuff like that is obviously against Kuvira because of what she's done and Bolin has history with Kuvira which means he has sort of conflicted thoughts about her uh, and ultimately sort of leaning on the side of not particularly liking her all that much right now but you could see he could maybe turn out, turn around on that. So they're the three people ultimately Kuvira has to sort of convince to really gain trust and you can't really do that while the three of them are brainwashed. And that's that's the problem here is that like when you brainwash a character, you sort of immediately take them out of being able to have character development because anything they do while they're brainwashed, you can't really blame them for it. And then all you can really do when you have them come out of the brainwashing is just feel like guilt for what they did. And that isn't exactly the character arc that we want our characters to go on in that like where can they go with the fact that, oh, Bolin, like, hurt Opal's shoulder? Like, it doesn't seem like it's a super bad injury, but it will be brought up when Bolin snaps out of this. But what can they do with that plot beyond, like, just Bolin feeling guilty and feeling very sorry about that? Or potentially Opal being annoyed at Bolin, even though she knows what happened? It just feels like you either have to make it a complete non-event that that happened, or you turn it into just kind of drama for the characters like there's no development there necessarily whereas you could have had Bolin and Kuvira development if he wasn't brainwashed and he has to work with Kuvira to like save Korra or save someone else and this is where like you could have done this with just say like even like say only Mako or something like that gets brainwashed and then you at least get Bolin and Asami getting a chance to, to work with Kuvira and that's probably the biggest missed opportunity here is that a lot of people have said it, but I do ultimately think it was a very poor decision of this book to brainwash Asami. I really think they shouldn't have done that because she's she's probably the, the, the main character most in need of character development. And through this, I don't think you're going to get that, especially after you had already set up fairly well the, the, the kind of um, fractured dynamic between Kuvira and Asami. So having Asami get brainwashed is just... It, it, it felt like they took this decision just to have the little bit of drama between Korra and Asami of like Korra having to see Asami like this when I think it would have been more impactful to have it be the other way around. Because we, I don't think we need to see Korra be upset at something happening again. Like we've seen Korra go through a lot of that before. She's so well developed as a character. I think we need more of Asami 
getting those sort of moments. And I think they just they just got it wrong in terms of I think the 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 wrong way around. In that the dynamic we want to see is will Asami change her view of Kavira after the events of this book in terms of beginning to trust her a little bit more, see why Korra is willing to give Kuvira so much of a chance, uh, get the moment where Kuvira apologizes to Asami for what happened to Hiroshi, what Kuvira did to Hiroshi, killing him. That needs to be brought up. And until Asami's not brainwashed, like we can't get that scene. And so th- this is like whenever you do a brainwashing scene, that, 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 that's the, the problem that you already have. You create a little bit of drama because oh, it's, it's the, the two characters who shouldn't be fighting, fighting. But then when you come out of it, like, there's only so much you can do, um, given that they're not going to commit to doing anything, like, huge, and that, like, okay, Opal got, like, a bruised shoulder or whatever out of this. Um, Korra had to see Asami say some hurtful words to her, and then, like, Mako is just kind of like, oh, he's sort of, like, the leader of Guan's forces uh, for a battle or two. But he hasn't really done anything necessarily yet. So th- th- that's the problem. I think there'd be much more potential in Kuvira having to team up with the three people who don't really trust her to get like Korra back or someone like that back. Th- th- that's where like arguably like imagine like Sue was Sue was one of the characters to get brainwashed. But you could you, I think you could have done a very similar thing there where. Uh, that would give Bolin a reason to want to get you know Sue back to get unbrainwash her. The rest of the group, of course, would want to help as well because they're all friendly with Sue, and it would give like Kuvira a, a drive as well to suddenly see her mother figure uh, get brainwashed as well. And um, it's just ultimately, despite the like you could sort of see the the really obvious kind of bullet points of like, what do you get out of brainwashing like Korra's best friends? You get Korra having to face off against them, but not that much versus like if you reverse the situation, change it a little bit, you actually do get more character development that way. Because what's going to happen with this in part three, getting back into the speculation, Batar is going to come into the story. He, maybe they'll bring Varric in as well, but either way, Kuvira and Batar are going to have to talk. They're going to have to team up together to use the information Kuvira has, the technical skills that Batar has, to find a way to reverse the brainwashing. It's going to be done on Asami first, very likely, because she's the obvious sort of test subject they have in terms of someone right here who is brainwashed to test a potential solution on. And then they work on a solution to do it on a wider scale to, to fix everyone. Um, how quickly or not this all happens over the course of the book is is kind of important in that if Asami gets sort of unbrainwashed fairly quickly it opens her up to do a lot in part three if it's left for late then it's kind of like you've you've wasted Asami for a book and you're saving what likely will be a scene you have to do which is Kuvira and Asami talking towards the end of the book you're you're probably gonna have to save that until right at the end um and th- that that's where like you get into the idea of like they have a plot to resolve here but ultimately i think what people care about the most in runes of the empire is not necessarily the plot it's actually just the character stuff people are here for kuvira kuvira and sue kuvira and batar kuvira and asami yes people care about the earth kingdom where they go with the earth kingdom like Wu's choice and uh that sort of thing, dealing with Guan. It's a, it's a pretty good plot, uh, considering some of the recent comic plots. But if they don't commit to doing something like big with Kuvira uh, on the character development front, uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to do anything big enough with just the, the core story, the core plot here, to make the, the, the story worthwhile. And that it will, they're going to have to balance like, getting the plot across without it feeling like the plot is taking over time that could be spent developing Kuvira, showing a, a Kuvira Sue backstory scene, uh, a Kuvira Batar backstory scene, that sort of thing. Because I think that's what everyone wants to see. They want to see with Kuvira and Batar, is there actually a romance between the two of them? We know... Batar loves Kuvira. We know it's there on his side of things. We don't know how he feels now necessarily. But with Kuvira, 
was it ever you know did she ever fe- care for him on her side or was it just using him for his uh, skills and as well as maybe to get back at Sue taking a member of her family away from her type of thing uh, that's where it's going to be pretty important to get it right uh, in terms of giving the time and that's where like arguably you have to show a flashback to how Kuvira viewed Batar when they were younger was there an attraction there then and it just she chose to kind of commit to it at a later point uh, how did it come about uh, and that's where it's kind of probably important to go a little bit more in depth on stuff like show us the moment where they left after Sue and Kuvira had the argument uh and Kavira left to become sort of the great uniter. What was the details of, around her and Batar getting together and how how it went down? The, 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 that sort of stuff. Is, is there going to be time to cover all that in enough detail? Uh, cover the Sioux part of that as well. Because that's all they've been pretty much doing with, with that main plot across part one and part two. It's been kind of tease, tease, tease these characters are not communicating well enough yet they haven't addressed the core problem yet uh they have not they, they are they've both sort of opened the door to communication here with kuvira radioing sue for help uh, prompting the the flashback from part two and then the scene with opal and sue getting across that opal is kind of like why are you kind of giving kuvira this kind of chance why are you so sort of um kind of on edge in a way about this like like you're you're lost in thought about kuvira why is why is that uh, do you still care for her type thing so the the doors open on both sides we're just waiting for that scene and what will it deliver what is it about because this going back to speculation before runes of the empire this is this is the book right right there it, it's how they get that scene across however they choose to do it whether it be through flashback from Sue's perspective, flashback from Kavira's perspective, or just a back and forth between them in the present day. You have to have a big conversation that gets across information about what Kavira's life was like living with Sue. Um, was it good? Was it bad? Was Sue a good mother? Was Kavira a bad daughter? Th- th- those type of things. And get across, how did it get to a point where Sue making the the decision that she made in book four to not step up and become the sort of temporary leader of the Earth Kingdom to stabilize things. Her not wanting to do that. Why that decision basically tore what otherwise we get the impression is a fairly good mother-daughter relationship in that like... Prior to that, you know, you had the scene like Kuvira is the captain of Sue's guard. Uh, they do this sort of uh, metal bending sort of uh, interpretive dance thing together that we saw in book three. There was the little bit of maybe like tension, if you can even call it that, in like the book three finale where like Kuvira wants to go with Sue to the big battle. But Sue says, no, Kuvira, you stay behind. And that's how Kuvira is able to save Tonrock later on. Um, but I... I don't really get the impression that like much of what was going on here was like, you know, Sue holding Kuvira back necessarily. So it's all about like, did Sue did did Kuvira maybe act out like she did with her her parents? Like like the the whole setup in over the course of the flashback in part one and part two is like asking you the question of like, do you blame the parents? Do you blame Kuvira for you know? I suppose effectively Kuvira turning out the way that she did. And ultimately, they, they've taken, I think, this very sort of middle-of-the-road perspective where, yes, like, like you can blame her parents to like for a lot of it in that they did ultimately give her away. They ultimately did abandon her. They, they, they could have, you know, really tried to help Kavira get her back on track, but they just gave up and, and gave her off to Sue. Um, and they... Did, they don't really seem to be, you know, at least in terms of like any sort of nuance, particularly trying to um, make you feel a massive amount of sympathy for the parents. But it's they're not they're also at the same time not taking away um, any of the sort of like responsibility on Kavira's part when she was younger. They they are getting across that 
Kubira didn't have a lot of discipline when she was younger. She probably did do some of the stuff that her parents blamed her for and she didn't admit to it. She didn't take responsibility for her actions. Now, did she deserve to be given away by her parents at that young of an age or not? Probably not, but it it gets across the idea that it is something from when she was younger that when she was older she still didn't quite kind of get over. So it's like a fundamental sort of character flaw type thing. And will they get back to that here and you know it, it seems like across part one and part two of Runes of the Empire Kavira is trying to take responsibility and trying to sort of redeem herself you know she surrendered so she's making sure that what's left of the Empire surrenders that she surrendered to Korra she's making good on that deal that she'll make it so that the Earth Empire has fully surrendered and she'll do what she can to regain the trust of the people that she does care about and try and move on make some progress because ultimately even if they can't do as much as they need to do with the character development type stuff like it probably will be a longer thing with sue a longer thing with batar opal those type of characters asami the one thing they have to do in part three of runes of the empire is address where Kuvira like is allowed to be going forward and that 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 goes back to the trial I think they have to sort of bookmark the book with um coming back to the trial which is basically where we started so you know the reason Kuvira is allowed to be out here doing stuff is because she's effectively been put into like Korra's custody like Korra will look after her as she helps uh, as like the sort of Earth Empire expert to deal with an Earth Empire threat. Well, we're still going to come back to the fact that Kavira still needs to be punished for what she did. She still was the villain of Book 4 and did all this stuff and is absolutely like guilty of pretty much everything that was said. Of th- that was said. The question though is, is it going to be interesting if, like, how interesting is it to just go back to that trial, Kavira's guilty, she goes to prison forever? Like that that just feels like so anticlimactic that that's all that we have to do in the book. And um, we have nothing else to really say beyond just careers in prison. Yes, logically they have to have Kuvira get some sort of a punishment. They just have to because of what she did, the magnitude of what she did. But at the same time, they can't just turn her into a the another Ozai, another Zaheer. Those two villains you you can have just sit in the prison and a character here or there will go to them when, when they're needed. I don't think Kavira is that sort of character. I think they've got across with this book and before that Kavira is like it's so sort of valuable as like how with how skilled she he- she is and how capable she is that her punishment should be something that you know helps people in some way and this is where this is where I think the way that they're going to go with it is that they go to the trial the judge reads out all the stuff that you're guilty of this Kavira the same list from part one that Kavira was angry at like we got her inner dialogue about like why she pled not guilty she might actually plead guilty this time but people who now sort of trust her a little bit more might speak up for her that actually I think it should be held into account here that she helped stop this thing from happening or you know addressing some of the stuff that she wished they had said in terms of positives that like the earth thing the earth uh, kingdom would still be in chaos if she didn't do at least part of what she did that she did stabilize it again as much as she then took over it was her in the first place who stopped it from being riots across the entire kingdom and you can tell that like in part one she wanted to get some credit for that and um you know it's one of those things like how you have to write it well this is where good writing is going to come into play of like you have to allow Kuvira a level of freedom in the story to be a character but also get a punishment that is like worthy of like everything that she did 
Um, but you, you, you still want to see her be able to have scenes with Korra, have scenes with like Asami or whoever. Uh, if they go back to Batar and Kavira, you want them to potentially be able to have a relationship, have a dynamic going forward. Talk to Sue more. And if they're if she's just in prison, you can still do it, but it's it's a little samey because it's the same situation as Oza, Oza. It's the same situation as the here. Um, so I think that's probably what they'll do is is they'll have enough characters speak up for Kuvira, probably Korra, um, probably um, Sue as as the two obvious ones, and just maybe good character witnesses almost will make it so that her punishment goes from potentially being like life in prison to being like you will always like what 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 way can they do this of like do something like where she will be that sort of recurring member of team avatar where like she will be free to be you know chosen by Korra to come on missions if she's needed type thing or or something like that that way like she can just still be in play somehow but she otherwise is is being punished or or whatever um I suppose just the idea of like community service you know for for someone so capable of like why sort of waste her when you could use her if she's really wanting to redeem herself because that's probably the biggest thing is just the sincerity from Kavira in part one and two that you you do get behind her in terms of like feeling a little bit for her that no one will trust her and her her wanting to to do as much as she can to help and uh it would be a bit of a shame to kind of waste that um but uh yeah i think that's most of what i want to talk about here um like I said, it, it's one of those things where, like, I, I think the speculation for part three is kind of pretty much the same after, like, part one. Part two solidifies a few things, but in general, we still don't exactly know sort of where we're heading. Um, uh, part two definitely could have done a little bit more to just direct us a bit more as to where we're going. There's a ton of pressure on part three to deliver. There's just so much that's going on. So much that has to be covered. Um, I'm not sure how confident I am about it. Like, I think they'll do some good stuff, but uh, I do get the feeling we might come out of this just a little bit disappointed that they could have done more. They probably should have done more in part one and two. And it'll be a situation where it's like, okay, how many years is it going to be before we come back to Kavira in the comics? Because... Do we want Kuvira to become the uh, the the Korra comic version of like Azula, where we only see the character every like three four years whenever they decide to include her in a comic, despite her being like one of if not the most interesting characters who has a character arc going on? Uh, that's what we want to avoid. So, in the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on speculation where you think Part Three is heading. But that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.